stock markets shaken, global supply chains cut off, imports interrupted. Globalization is faltering thanks to coronavirus. But in an age of trade wars and nationalism, could this be a taste of things to come? This is Roundtable. Hello there, I'm Shuli Ghosh. Even before the new coronavirus outbreak, global trade was slowing down and the spread of COVID-19 is making things worse. Denting demand for goods and making production more difficult. Add in protectionist policies and trade wars and some are arguing that globalization is moving into reverse gear. Coronavirus has delivered a shock to the world economy, with stock markets falling further than at any time since the financial crisis of 2008. But the virus has exposed other problems too, with complicated global supply chains faltering, production hit and services interrupted. For now, our globalized economy is stuttering and globalization itself is facing new questions. Is it in the right shape to face the threats of spreading viruses, climate change or widespread austerity? Some politicians have responded with trade barriers, militarized borders and other headline-grabbing policies. But does this global problem need a global coordinated solution? Let's welcome today's guests. In the roundtable studio, we're joined by Abine Mutu, Professor of Economics at the University of Warwick, and David Blunt, author of Global Poverty, Injustice and Resistance. And joining us from New Jersey in the US, we have Harold James, Professor in History and International Affairs at Princeton University. Gentlemen, welcome to all of you. Uh, let me start with my uh, Skype guest, Harold. Uh, analysts saying that we've actually seen a systemic uh, decline in globalization with issues like climate change, uh, protectionism, and now we have the coronavirus. Is this going to precipitate a waning in globalization, do you think? I, I think uh, globalization has been under attack since the great financial crisis over 10 years ago in uh, 2007, 2008. Um, and the, the phenomenon of trade not growing as quickly as industrial output uh, it has been there for a few years. Um, but uh, what we're seeing is a new kind of challenge. And there's, a, there's an irony behind all of this because the big problems of the world, uh, climate change or dealing with the coronavirus, are common problems that we have to face together. And so, in a sense, there's a greater demand for international cooperation than there was before. Uh, but we're seeing all the bits of international cooperation except electronic communication, the kind of thing that we're doing now over, over, the, over the satellite. Uh, we're seeing that uh, diminished. Uh, leaders don't want to meet each other. Um, uh, conferences are canceled, meetings are canceled, uh, trade flows are- But these, uh, these are temporary measures right. though, aren't they, because of coronavirus? Well, they're temporary measures, but um, I, I think uh, one of the phenomena that we see is that uh, people realize the extent of vulnerability. And so they're going to make sure in the future that they're not vulnerable in that sense anymore. For instance, uh, many countries are running out of face masks or sanitizers. Those are things that are produced a long way away um, and are interrupted now because the factories that were producing them in China uh, have been closed down. Um, and I, I think the reaction to it will be an intensification of an existing trend that is to produce more locally. Uh, le well, let's see if our guests agree with that. Abine, uh, globalization has had, you know, considerable momentum over the last few decades, um, but there now does seem to be a, a growing backlash against it and, uh, and a, 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 a trend um, to try and return to a more national or local economy. What do you think? So, so that is true that uh, over, the last, over the last few years, and maybe even from the end of the crisis, the financial crisis, there's been a backlash, there's been a retreat, and you see that manifested uh, across various nations through the rise of populism uh, and so on. And the reason one has to understand, which I think the world communities, the leaders are understanding, is that one of the ill effects, one of the bad effects of globalization for the last 20, 30 years 
has been, a lot of people have been left behind, the cliche left behind. And I think the states across different countries haven't paid enough attention to that, or the, or while globalization at the speed it was taking place was taking place. So I see over the next 10, 15 years, globalization is continuing, by the way, maybe at a smaller speed than it was. It's continuing. We don't know that. We, people don't realize that. But at a smaller speed. For the last next 10, 15 years, nations, whether it's the US, whether it's Britain with Brexit, they're going to focus on, the government is going to focus on what, what Boris Johnson points out, leveling up. And so well, I see... Wasn't the whole so I, point of globalization, sorry to interrupt you, wasn't the whole point of globalization to bring prosperity to all? Wasn't it sold to us as something that was going to make the so world it has, richer? So it has. I mean, prosperity at the aggregate level has increased tremendously. But the benefits, the, 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 the beneficiaries haven't, haven't been everyone. And that's been the problem. there have been big there, benefits. There's absolutely been beneficiaries. If you look at the billionaire class, they've done incredibly well out of... Uh, out of globalization, I think. Well, hang on. I mean, consumers have also benefited yeah. from, from cheaper prices. Well, of course, consumers have benefited from cheaper prices, but middle class people in the developed world have also seen wage stagnation. They've seen attacks on their pensions. They've seen uh, people like uh, Jeff Bezos gaining a lot of money, a real lot of money. Uh, the billionaire class has seen their net wealth increase, I think, quadruple since 1988. Uh, this has been an uneven distribution of wealth across the world. The benefits have not been shared equally. Uh, but a lot of people in the developing world have done very well out of globalization. Workers in China, workers in India, these people have been very strong beneficiaries of globalization, and they're not going to be that willing to roll it back either. Harold, do you agree with that, that there's more anger than ever before over what are the perceived failures of globalization um, and uh, the inequality that it's bred and the exploitation of cheap labor are now some of the driving factors behind uh, a backlash against globalization. Yes, that's absolutely right. But uh, as you were pointing out, uh, there's also a phenomenon that uh, poorer people in particular have benefited uh, from cheaper goods. Um, and uh, so when you're thinking about a backlash on trade, uh, we're seeing this very much in the United States. It's a very, very intense discussion uh, that, in theory, many people think, yes, we're uh, being undermined by production in China and elsewhere. But then when it comes to asking, do you want to pay $600 more or $1,000 right. more for an iPhone? Um, you know, maybe I can afford that, but many people really can't afford that. And an iPhone uh, or some kind of smartphone is part of the basic, basic infrastructure of modern social life. Uh, so a lot of poor people would really be badly hit uh, by a rollback of globalization on the trade front. And that's true of the migration issue as well. Because if you think of something, you know, you're in the UK, uh, how the National Health Service operates, um, it operates because it has a large number of people who've come from other countries to work at all kinds of levels as administrators, as doctors, as nurses, as cleaners, all through the National Health Service. And if that kind of migration is going to be stopped, uh, then you're really going to have a problem in the provision of basic services. So yeah, and this is one of the things they talk about in with, a with Brexit. Where globalization is locked in. Yeah. And one way of putting it is that aggregate world growth of the last 20 years has been huge. You know, if you add it up, um, and from an economist's point of view, efficiency has improved quite a bit at the aggregate level. What's not happened is the other element, which is redistribution. And you made the point: inequality has risen tremendously over the last 20 years while globalization has been booming. And I think, going back to the future, looking at the future, the next 20 years, the focus of governments across the world will be on addressing, to some extent, and we'll see how, and, uh, on, on, on uh, redistribution issues. The governments that, that you're talking about who, who are going to now um, concentrate on inequalities are being influenced by this rise in, in protectionism. Um, we see, you know, uh, in, in the in the UK, talking about um, becoming more UK-based, uh, make America great again. These are all catchphrases uh, that we're hearing. How does that growth in protectionism impact on um, the, this idea of, of, of a global community, global trade? Well, I think we're going to see how flimsy these slogans are, right? You know, Boris Johnson can't go into a lab and start yelling, you know, uh, let's get vaccination done. It's not going to produce results. You know, the coronavirus does not respect borders. 
climate change, does not respect borders. Uh, it's very tempting to retreat under the safety blanket of nationalism and to close borders. But the challenges of the 21st century are global challenges. They'll need global solutions. But doesn't something like coronavirus feed into the, 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 the nationalist narrative that, that we're hearing in some countries now? Well, yeah, I mean... It does, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. But, you, you know, I think it's, it's really very, very hard to think of ways in which you can protect yourself by the corona, from the coronavirus by just cutting yourself off. If you think back to the a story of uh, medieval Europe. Um, the plague spread, although there was much less communication then, mm. uh, but even in remote villages, uh, that the plague comes because people need uh, cloth, they need clothing. Uh, they, so they, so can, we look at, can we learn something I, from looking back at the lessons that were learned during that Black Death pandemic, and how did that affect uh, interconnectedness and, and, and the economy and, and the idea of globalization? Well, the, the, the Black Death was obviously much more extreme in terms of the mortality uh, than anything even the most pessimistic figures uh, give about the coronavirus. So uh, something like a third of the European population died in the Black Death, and that had an immediate impact uh, on, on raising wages uh, for the survivors. So labor was much scarcer uh, after the Black Death. I don't imagine, I, I don't think anybody imagines an impact of that kind uh, that will make labor so much scarcer that incomes will basically rise just because of the extent of mortality. David, you were talking about um, uh, the idea of a, of a vaccination. Mm. Surely that is exactly the kind of thing that globalization would help us with when we see different countries coming together Absolutely. for a solution. You know, for example, we could be more uh, generous in funding the World Health Organization and coordinating global reactions to things like pandemic diseases. You can't anticipate when a new sort of pandemic strain is going to emerge, but you can plan for it, right? You can anticipate the patterns which pandemics take across the world. You can have models. You can anticipate. Uh, you can have the infrastructure in place to do the but research. Haven't we been here already with SARS and MERS? Uh, yes, but with the uh, rollback of, uh, in, of investment in global institutions has been very profound since the financial crisis, and now we're seeing the consequence, right? Uh, President Trump uh, gutting the CDC in the United States, for example, has left that country vulnerable. Gutting the World Health Organization leaves the world vulnerable. Uh, it leaves us at the mercy of private actors uh, like the pharma industry or the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to do the work that our governments should be trying to coordinate with each other. One of the problems we have is that the international institutions we have in place now were developed post-war. To be frank, I think they need reform, and some of them need big-time reform. They're not fit, uh, if I may use that word, for this century. And that reform, you know, takes time. There's not a revolution that's going to happen on new institutions popping up. So I think, I, I think that's going to happen in parallel, parallel with states leveling up. I think so that has to happen. So you're going to have leveling up happening over the next 20 years. It's a 20 years agenda. Globalization will continue to progress at a slower pace than you saw the last 20 years. And new institutions or reform of existing institutions will happen over the next 20 years. So we're going through a time of disruption. I was say, you're making it sound quite easy. Oh, but I, I, I mean, I, do, do, is this... When it comes to addressing inequalities, I mean, these are historical um, problems of structure which have been in place for, for many, many decades. Oh, absolutely. You know, people who have wealth are loath to give it up. People who have power are loath to give it up. But eventually, we're going to be facing a, a situation not unlike France in the Ancien Régime, where the status quo cannot hold. So we have to be thinking about what sort of world do we want to create? And are we going to take leadership in creating it? because it's going to change. And uh, the challenges that we're seeing on the horizon, things like climate change, global poverty, mass human migration, they're not going away. And the state seems very unsuited to solve them. The international institutions of the post-war settlement also have not been designed for this world. We need new institutions for the 20th, 21st century. Otherwise, we are going to see a massive disruption that will make coronavirus seem like a, a wonderful day in the park. Harold, do you agree with that? Can, can yeah, globalization yeah, yeah. be I, I, I mean, I agree completely that, uh, that, that there's a need for an institutional transformation. Um, but we also need to see that this is quite an urgent problem. In, if you look back, um, when things uh, have a long time schedule, uh, you, you very rarely get uh, precise, urgent action. 
uh, if you think of the origins of the post-war institutions, they were basically in the last phases of the World War II, uh, when it was necessary to get a, an, an immediate structure in place very, very quickly, because people realized in 1944 that the war was going to end quite soon. Uh, so we need something uh, really quite urgent, but we don't just need to think about international cooperation. I think that's very, very important. Uh, but we also need to think of technical changes. And so, for instance, one of the things I think that the coronavirus uh, story is going to do is to push telemedicine much faster and much quicker, uh, much more thoroughly than it has been uh, practiced so far. Uh, the medical profession has resisted that uh, for obvious reasons. Um, but if you can do diagnoses and uh, prescriptions uh, remotely, uh, it, it, it does some of the things about leveling up. One of the questions about leveling up, for instance, is that large parts of uh, the United States or of the UK or continental Europe um, don't have good schools, don't have medical facilities, uh, and uh, people feel, feel cut off because of that. Uh, they need to be brought in, and uh, th that's, a, that's a technological uh, Your point about it being hard, can I just say it is going to be hard for the reasons David pointed out, because of vested interests. That's the way human beings are. Take climate change, for example. The United States has pulled out of the Paris Agreement. The United States is one of the biggest countries. So just imagine, how are you going to get anything done unless the U.S. is going to play? Uh, and I think that, and that so actually... that's, going to take, that's going to happen. That's going to happen. Of course it's going to happen. But it will take time to persuade them. The mechanisms, how are we going to do that? And so, this idea, I mean, climate change feeds into yeah. that, about it, it's not just the inequalities. It's the idea that a lot of people are, are scared about being totally dependent on supply chains which are happening thousands of miles away. Never mind that it's bad for cl climate change, which it clearly is. So when we see something like coronavirus and we see our supermarkets cleared of toilet rolls and hand sanitizers and, and whatever else it is, um, it, that's a wake-up call that we don't produce our own stuff. We but are so listen, dependent on other countries. Throughout human countries. history, prosperity has happened for the last 3,000 years as we have globalized. Mm -hmm. Globalization in a different form was happening 500 years ago and so on. I think, of course, you have shocks and therefore you retreat. And that's what we are observing right now. Because in the end of the day, I want my iPhone for $100, not for $600. That's what drive the humans, human beings, right? So globalizations in terms of the, uh, people connecting is going to happen. It's happening as we speak, but at a slower pace. Yeah. And it's not just that they want uh, an iPhone for an affordable price. They want a better iPhone. And globalization right. enables people to cooperate, to innovate. You know, people are not going to retreat back into a you know, quiet status quo of mediocre so products. So we're never going to go back we're never going to wind the clock back to a time where we have our own national and local economies, are we? I mean, I, I, we're, we're basically, globalization is, is the only way to go. The genie is out of the bottle. Well, right. I, 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 th I think you can see something quite interesting. That is that it's actually the technology that gives you the potential to shorten supply chains because of exactly. techniques like three-dimensional printing. Uh, you, you, you can really produce things much closer to the, the consumer. Uh, than you could um, uh, a few years ago or decades ago, uh, where there was a much more intense international division of labor. Um, it, it, it's technology that's allowing you to, to produce things uh, closer to where the eventual demand is. What impact do we think coronavirus is going to have uh, on uh, world trade and economy and globalization, given that China is basically the factory of the world and um, it is now... Uh, yeah. largely shut, and there are conspiracy theories abounding, and, and they're worried about a, a, a drop-off in, in, in foreign selling goods to foreign countries. So coronavirus is going to, is a shock. It's going to be a big shock in, in relative terms on the economy, on people. Absolutely, there's no question about that, over the next six to eight months, so I think. So it's going to be a shock. Oh, it's a temporary shock. What I expect will happen at the end of it, will GDP will contract. UK, I think UK GDP will contract by half a percent and so on. So we know that. Uh, but after this year, business as usual. The world is going to continue going to grow. Uh, I, I, I don't think it will be business as usual in many in areas. In the sense of so, uh, growth. I think, for instance, uh, tourism, uh, airline travel, uh, conferences, uh, th those kind of things are going to be really permanently reduced. Do you think that's going so, to be a long-term impact? I, I disagree with that. So. I think when, so when I meant business as usual, I don't mean that 
we go back to uh, last year. But absolutely, on that particular point, Harold, I think that come next year, we'll forget this. People will want to travel as they were a year ago. Absolutely. Conference and events. That's human nature. You want to constantly do better. Uh, we've had lots of institutions, uh, uh, companies, uh, organizations, governments, uh, universities over the last uh, few days uh, saying you, you absolutely need to cut out uh, inessential travel. For this um, period, for this period, for this next six months. If it's inessential, why was it done in the first place? And uh, people are really going to question that. And they're going to say, much more, you know, can't we interact as I'm interacting with you at the moment? Well, I think face-to-face -face interaction is always going to be more valued. I mean, I, I think there will be a push towards digitizing some forms of communication, but there is this essential need to look someone well, in the I eyes. I mean, right? Harold's got a point in that uh, the, there was... Uh, there's a big push against inessential travel anyway because of greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. So, you know, why are we flying all over the world if we can talk like it's this? Not, it's not going to happen because unless the price coronavirus goes Because coronavirus is exactly. not the only impact on, on globalisation, as we've established. I mean, uh, many analysts are saying that actually this need to um, restructure industries and, and cut down on extremely long cross-border <coughs> supply chains because of climate change is actually going to have a bigger impact. Look, it might drive forward innovation, but there will always be a temptation for the status quo, right? Because the status quo is what's already been paid for. You know, if we can keep things ticking over, that's what businesses and that's what governments will try to do. That's what they tried to do after 2008. Now, I agree that what we should be thinking about is how do we change the international system? How do we make globalization less volatile? And that's going to be the challenge, but it's going to take strong leadership. But that's not really there available. There's not really competition into this. So go back, let's use a simple example of conference travel. Suppose Princeton University tells Princeton faculty, academics, professors, you can't travel, but Harvard and MIT allow it. The Princeton academics is going to say, oh my God, we're going to, we won't be at that conference making the deal, getting that cool but paper out, there is and therefore, and therefore competition, is going to, competition is going to, no, going to not, not, not allow universities to do what Harold you're saying. Prices, if you raise prices on fares, that's the way to, if you want to affect. And right now, debate in the UK is to, to deal with climate change, it put taxes up on... on, on, yeah. on, on no, no, that's and, absolutely and, right. And there's a kind of perverse effect at the moment that the, uh, because of the fallback in transport, the oil prices are collapsing so that it becomes very much cheaper. If you want absolutely. to go to a website at the moment and book a transatlantic fare, it's extraordinarily cheap, um, and uh, th th that's exactly the human beings right. respond to incentives. So, so let me ask you all: do, you know, looking ahead at, at all the factors which are affecting um, the global village and globalization at the moment, at the moment, do you think there are going to be more barriers or less barriers um, for globalization in the future? So, more compared barriers. to 20 years ago, there'll be a bit more, as I keep pointing, over the next 10 years, relatively speaking, but it'll still be possible for academics, for businesses to trade across the world. Even though we're seeing more trade wars and... We're not seeing trade wars in, in the sense that it, the way you're portraying it. Of course, there's right now a kind of a trade war between yes, the US a, and China. a small and China. one between small the US one. and China. I, I, I don't what? foresee a major trade war happening between those two countries anytime soon. David, I mean, the million dollar question is, how do we encourage the positive effects of globalization whilst minimizing the inequalities. Uh, well, I think what's been said, you know, incentives are incredibly important. People have to see that change is going to benefit them in the long run. It can't be seen as a draconian sort of go on austerity, give up all the things you love. We need to reorganize the world in a way that people can buy into because that's the sort of creatures we are. You know, we need to be able to show that this is to our advantage. We don't want climate change. We don't want pandemic diseases. We need to invest a little bit to get a massive return. Harold, do you think there is commitment and incentive enough for governments um, to make those kind of changes, particularly when we look at governments today which are more insular, like the United States? So the larger the country is, um, whether it's the United States or China, the more it will think that it can do something on its own. Uh, the smaller a country is, uh, the more it realizes that it's actually deeply connected. So if you go to uh, Latvia or Estonia, uh, nobody's really going to talk about a rollback of globalization there uh, because they realize quite how dependent they are on the rest of the world. Um, and in, in a sense, uh, what we need is a, 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 a realization of how important it is for the rest of the world, uh, the, 
not the United States, not the Chinas, uh, to cooperate together. And well, uh, that's exactly, I think, the role that a strong international institution. I mean, Harold, you're right, but we need the US and China part of that conversation. So I think that we have to accept, for the next five years, we are retreating. There's a lot of nationalism and populism. We have to accept that's the way the world is in that phase, that cycle. The world goes through cycles, while as globalization is continuing in parallel behind the scenes through technological disruptions. In five, 10 years, over this period, there'll be conversations about reform and how we better cooperate. But that's, the, that's how I paint the world. But in the long run, the forces of human nature are, let's go out okay. and discover. And the thing is, there okay. is no Chinese-only solution to climate change, and there is no America-only solution to the coronavirus. It's be a cl a it global has to be solution. a collective effort. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for your collective efforts. Good to have you in the studio with me. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Indeed. Thank, you. thank you to all of you. Remember, you can see more discussion and debate on our YouTube channel. Search for TRT World Roundtable. For now, from me and all the team here, bye-bye. Thanks for watching.